So we're now going to have a, a, a slight change to the advertised program and that we're now going to um, hear from Dr. David Milan and Dr. Somia Das, who are colleagues from uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, respectively. And they're going to um, review some very exciting new topics and some new research of potential um, agents that may be used in the treatment of long QT syndrome. They're going to present some of their basic research and how this may translate to patient populations. So David Somia, thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you, uh, Dominic. And um, we also, I'm David Milan, and this is Sami Das. We're colleagues at different hospitals at the Mass General, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But I also wanted to thank the organizers, the, the people who've uh, put the hard work into making this day possible. Um, this is the first long QT day ever um, for us, and, and uh, we hope you like it, because I think it's really a great opportunity to share information about um, this important syndrome. So, um, all right, so, so this is me and Samia, and then that, that's the long QT there. So just a little bit of background. Samia and I have known each other since medical school um, many years ago now, and um, we've uh, sort of pursued separate paths, but now sort of almost have uh, reconvened uh, around sort of electrophysiologists. So I'm an electrophysiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, where uh, I treat adult patients, and Samia is an electrophysiologist at the Beth Israel Hospital, where he treats uh, adult patients some of them with long QT syndrome, and we both have basic science laboratories. And um, it turns out that our work um, has led to potential discoveries that could lead to treatments for long QT, which we're excited about and we want to tell you about today. So I'll start by telling you about the stuff in my lab, and then Sami will tell you about the stuff going on in his lab. So we started with this sort of observation that we know there's a lot of drugs, and we've discussed it even today, that cause QT prolongation, unintended side effect of drugs that, for instance, are antibiotics or antidepressants or many different uh, types of medications have this unintended uh, consequence of prolonging the QT interval. And, it, and now that we know about it, we spend a lot of, we, I mean, pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of effort trying to avoid those drugs because it's an important problem. Uh, and we wanted to know, could we do the opposite? Could we find a drug that shortens the QT interval because this uh, is an important problem? And so uh, in order to try and answer this question, we used zebrafish in my lab. So zebrafish, these are cartoons of zebrafish, but uh, the, I, they do have stripes and they do have hearts. And, um, and, and the interesting thing, or at least one interesting thing about zebrafish is that they can develop long QT syndrome. So there's, there is a genetic uh, long QT syndrome, long QT type two that affects the zebrafish. And we thought that it would be um, a, an interesting tool. So I'm gonna show you now actual, not cartoons, but this is an actual video of a zebrafish heart so th there, are, there are potential advantages of, ze sorry, this is playing in the wrong order, potential advantages of zebrafish, but one of them is that they are transparent during their early life. And so you can look at their heart as it beats, as opposed to having to record an EKG or, or something like that. And you can look repeatedly over time without having to sort of, you know, do surgery and open them up and look at their hearts. You can just look at them under a microscope. So, so once again, now I'll show you this. Uh, this is a normal zebrafish heart. So it has two chambers. It's hard to appreciate here, but there's a chamber behind here, the atrial chamber, the upper chamber, and then there's a chamber in front, the ventricular chamber, and, and they beat together first the atrium, then the ventricle, then the atrium, then the ventricle, and that's normal for a zebrafish, okay? But this zebrafish, which is from a, essentially a zebrafish family with long QT syndrome, has the, the, the atrium is beating twice every time the ventricle beats once, okay? So this is what a long QT syndrome looks like in the zebrafish. And we've done recordings. We know that, the, that these fish actually do have sort of long QT syndrome. Their cardiomyocytes have action potentials. Remembering back to Vasilios' talk, the action potential of the cardiomyocytes are prolonged, and that, that cor corresponds to a long QT interval. And this phenotype is what we call two to one atrioventricular block. And it's interesting to us um, that um, it's been reported that infants with long QT syndrome can sometimes develop this two to one AV block. It's been reported over and over again. This is just one of the examples that this can happen. And the infants often outgrow it. And interestingly, the zebrafish do too. But before they outgrow it, we thought we would put this to our advantage. So remember, this is a question. Can we take a long QT and find medications or drugs or compounds that will shorten it? And so in order to answer that question, we take the zebrafish with the long QT syndrome and we put them in plates with 96 wells. And that allows us to treat them with random compounds from from 
from collections of compounds called chemical libraries, and we, we treat each well with a different compound, and then we develop automated methods using a, a microscope to go visit each well and record, make a recording, a video recording of each of these zebrafish hearts, and, and we've actually got the, vi the, the computer to look at the, each recording and tell us whether or not the rhythm is that two-to-one block or one-to-one, -one. and then doing that, we've discovered molecules that rescue the zebrafish long QT. So that's great, they treat fishes long QT, but that's not our goal, right? The, 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 our goal is to treat human long QT, and so, but you have to build your way up there. So, so now, without going through all of the details of how, how we've done this, I can tell you that we've tested this compound that I just showed you in, in guinea pigs. So guinea pigs, unlike mice, which don't have QT prolongation like humans do, but guinea pigs do. We've tested in guinea pigs, and we can shorten the QT interval in the guinea pigs, so that's a good thing. And in rabbits, rabbits actually have QT intervals very similar to humans as well. And when we cause QT prolongation in rabbits, you can actually produce the rhythm that we've all been talking about, which is dangerous, which is torsade. And, and when we treat the rabbits with our compound, instead they don't develop that torsade. So, so now it's not just that it shortens a QT, but it can also seem to prevent the arrhythmia that we're all worried about in the long QT syndrome. So, so great, so now ze zebrafish, guinea pigs, and rabbits, but still we want to know about humans, right? But, but you understand that you, know, it's, you have to do a lot of things before you can test a compound in, in humans. So instead, we've turned to something, and, and this is a little bit out of order, because I think Bill Poo's going to talk much more extensively about stem cell uh, technology, but, so not to preempt his, his uh, story, but, but just to say that we can take blood cells, or more commonly skin cells, from a patient with long QT syndrome and make them into stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and then take those cells and make them into heart cells, and then recording from those heart cells, we can measure the action potential duration. And when you do that, and again, we can ask this question, does our drug shorten the action potential now, and not the QT interval, because individual cells don't have a QT interval, but they have these action potentials, and we want to shorten those action potentials. So. Here are the results that we, that rabbit shouldn't be there yet. Sorry, the animation is a little off. But th these are human cells now taken from, from humans. And here's, in black, is, is, is from a patient who didn't have long QT syndrome. And you can see the black tracing here is from a patient who had long QT type 2. And this one's from a patient with long QT type 3. And, and the black tracings are much longer than, than, than the sort of patient without long QT syndrome. And then when we treat with our compound, which is called 2-MMB, you can see that these action potentials shorten considerably. So when we saw these data, we were very excited. I mean, this is the first time that we saw that they could actually work in cells that come from humans to shorten the QT interval. So now that rabbit's supposed to be there. Uh, it, it, we, we have evidence that it works in guinea pigs, rabbits, and, and now finally humans. So there's a long way to go, obviously, before we we're able to... Um, tell you that this is ready for use, but we're very excited about this technology and especially this compound or this class of compounds that it might someday be a, a good treatment for long QT syndrome. Okay, so now Sam is gonna tell you about a sort of independent approach that is, I think, probably equally promising for the treatment of long QT syndrome. Great, <clears throat> so uh, as David said, uh, um, you know, David and I had uh, been in medical school 14 years ago, and then we sort of diverged. Um, and I was working on a quite a different area, um, which remarkably over the last few years had converged onto this um, similar sort of pathway. Um, so this morning you heard from Vasilios that potassium and sodium are the two big um, currents that are important in uh, long QT syndrome. And we think David's compound probably treats potassium currents. And so to cover all our bases, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we had done that uh, remarkably seems to work on sodium currents. So if we could have a platform that could treat both sodium and potassium currents, then we would have a pretty comprehensive uh, platform to develop therapies for long QT syndrome. So um, I had been working on... Oops. Can I move this? So I had been working on, on a certain protein, and... Um, what you've heard about today are mostly um, ion channels which conduct the uh, sodium and potassium in and out the cell. But these ion channels are also um, uh, subject to treatment by other types of proteins in the cell. And there are proteins called kinases which act on these channels and they can change the way these channels behave. So they can make more sodium come in or they can make more potassium come in or leave the cell. 
And so one of these we had been working on was a kinase, and to simplify things, I'll just call it kinase K, and this apparently worked on the sodium channel and is an extremely important regulator of the sodium channel. And when this kinase is activated, you get a lot more sodium coming into the cell. Um, and you sort of heard from Vasilios that uh, in, in patients with long QT syndrome, you can either get less potassium leaving the cell or you can get more potassium in, coming into the cell. So, so we actually tried to assess, well, if this has such a big effect on sodium, what happens if this kinase is active? And if this kinase is active, um, you can see that these are, uh, um, this is actually a mouse where the kinase is active. You can see that the QT interval is quite prolonged. And as David has said, it's actually very hard to prolong the QT interval in mice. And so this we thought was very interesting that you could actually prolong it so far. And uh, by this time, you're all experts on action potentials. You've seen all these things now. Um, and so we thought, huh, that's interesting. Um, this looks quite similar to QT intervals in, in uh, patients with long QT syndrome. So could there be a connection between um, this kinase that we had been studying on, without knowing its effect on long QT syndrome and uh, what David had been studying for many years? Um, to, to look at that a little further, we um, stressed these mice that have this activation of um, this kinase. And what you can see is that in normal mice, you can... Uh, make them go, you can stress them and their heart rate picks up, but they don't get these arrhythmias that David had shown as well. In these mice where the kinase is active, they actually get a lot of these dangerous arrhythmias. And so this is again similar to patients with uh, long QT where, you know, if you exercise and you're stressing yourself or you hear a doorbell ring and you get emotional stress, you can get these types of arrhythmias. So again, something that was quite similar when this kinase was active um, and uh, long QT syndrome. Um, I uh, told you at the offset that we think this works on, on the sodium uh, current, and in fact, when you take cells and you activate this kinase, you get an increase in the sodium current, and when you, interestingly, when you block it, now you get a decrease in the sodium current. So we said, aha, uh -huh. I wonder if we block this, could we actually reverse all these things that we're seeing? And so we, uh, that's when I talked to David and I said, you have this family of fish with long QT syndrome, and you've done, you know, David had done uh, a great screen identifying new chemicals. And I said, well, let's see if our chemical, which can block this kinase, has the same effect. And surprisingly, it does the same thing. So th these are our mice, which have, uh, you can see, percent of rescue. So these are the mice that are, uh, or sorry, zebrafish that are getting rescued. And you can see that when we block the kinase, either genetically or with our drug, we can actually rescue these zebrafish, similar to what David showed when he rescued his, uh, with his compound. So uh, that's sort of, I don't want to bore you with sort of details of the data, but that's really the gist of uh, two different approaches to the same problem, which we think has promised because it covers both the sodium and, and potassium currents that are important in this syndrome. So uh, one thing we get asked is, you know, uh, you've heard about beta blockers for treatment. You've heard about, prevent, you know, stopping doing exercise. So why do we really need a new therapy for long QT syndrome? And uh, I came from this uh, uh, from the perspective of an adult uh, um, electrophysiologist. And one of the biggest things I see is when I see a teenager or a young college student who has long QT syndrome, it's really hard to convince them not to exercise. And you know, as someone who has played soccer all their life um, can't play soccer. So um, this really is bigger, the biggest problem that I face when I'm dealing with sort of young people who are active, who have been really good at sports and now all of a sudden can't do sports. And so one of the thoughts we had was, wouldn't it be great if we had a drug that could actually treat the long QT syndrome? Remember, beta blockers don't actually shorten your QT interval, but if we had a drug that could shorten the QT interval, could we in the future um, be able to tell patients that you could hopefully exercise without worry? Could we reduce arrhythmias on those patients who have defibrillators who have had shocks because of arrhythmias from the long QT syndrome? Um, maybe, and this is a pipe dream right now, but if we could actually treat the disease by shortening the QT interval, could we in the future um, obviate the need for ICDs altogether? So uh, to, to do this, it's hard to uh, um, get grant support for things that are sort of pipe dreams. And so to try and really make this forward to see if we could move this into 
a clinical arena eventually where we can treat patients because that's what we both want to do. We uh, started a company called Long QT Therapeutics. It's in its incipient stage, but we, we're both committed to um, really try and get this uh, developed and moved forward. But we do, to do this sort of, we, we do need your help. And you've heard of many diseases where patients and patient families have been advocates for it. Um, because a lawmaker or a, uh, a company may not understand how important this is to all of us. And so we need your help in terms of advocacy, in terms of, you know, talking with us and giving us your ideas. Uh, it would be great if you told us, you know, this is the reason why we want a drug for this. Uh, companies and investors want to hear that, that there are people who really uh, want to work with us to, to develop new treatments. And so uh, I would encourage you to kind of uh, come and talk to us. We'll be around at um, lunch and, and get involved. And um, so I'll stop here and take any other questions. So this is all still pretty early. Um, um, you can see uh, David's drug has been tested in cells from patients with long QT. We still need to make a drug that can be taken as a pill form, for example. Um, so I anticipate it's still a few years out from that. Um, and I think your question is a good one in terms of what is the strategy going to be. And I think initially the strategy might well be that first you take it with a beta blocker because that's known how to work and see that it actually shortens intervals and if it does, then maybe down the road you can start thinking about, well, are we actually curing the disease instead of just decreasing the triggers for the, for the arrhythmias? So that's a, it's a great question because anytime you make a new drug, and particularly if any of you have been on antiarrhythmic drugs, they have many other side effects. Um, for, for, for the kinase, I can talk uh, address that. In fact, if you take the kinase and completely delete it in mice, for example, then uh, they, have no, they, they have a completely normal life. They have a little bit of high blood pressure, but that's about it. So that's a reasonable trade-off, I would think. Um, in, uh, and David, uh, in terms of your... Right, so, so just recognizing it's still early, we, we've seen no uh, negative effects of our compounds yet. I, I just had a very similar question about the specificity um, of the inhibitors. So, kind of similar. Yeah, no, I think one of the key things anytime you develop drugs that target kinase is, is to make sure um, that you hit the target and not other things. So that's a big part of the pipeline going forward, and we think we have some compounds that are pretty specific for this particular kinase and not others. But that's, again, something we have to keep a close eye on. At least a few years, right. That pill, like, that would be on market or? No, so, so the market is obviously, then you have to go through FDA and regulation and clinical trial, but, you know, the goal is hopefully in a few years we may have sort of first in human trials, but, you know, there's a lot of work between now and then. <laughs> 